Do you want to give us an appetizer of what that lab is going to be? Uh, yeah, so we're going to really with? focus on like the pelvic trauma on how to do stuff percutaneously. Nice. Uh, and how to do it uh, if uh, the robot has failed and you, now your navigation has failed. So we'll do so it all with Flora. So we bot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so we are going to, yeah, so AODs, uh, super exciting. Are we over-treating this? Uh, there's a short answer, but we'll get to that at the end. Um, so the objective, so uh, we're going to, you know, I, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, relationship between timely diagnosis and outcome, uh, re uh, review the optimal initial treatment, and uh, review sort of the subtle clinical um, signs uh, in, making diagnose, in making a diagnosis when sometimes a diagnosis is difficult to make. So... Um, you're, you're going to hear different terms for this entity. So craniocervical dissociation, atlantocipital dislocation, occipital cervical dislocation, occipital cervical dissociation. All of this just, like all these different variations just means that the head is not really connected to the, the upper cervical spine. Uh, these can be the result of high energy mechanisms. Um, so associated poly, um, there's a lot of associated polytrauma. These are rarely isolated. Um, a lot of times there's concomitant facial trauma, a uh, high rate of concomitant uh, TBI. Um, which means that we, uh, sometimes the patients can't participate in the exam. Um, if, uh, you know, you do a quick, like, pub med search, um, there really isn't much on these injuries, you know, prior to the mid-90s, right? And it's not like we discovered these. Um, and the issue is that the early literature, you know, this is how stuff was described. It was the occasional case report. This is potentially survivable, you know? So this is what, you know, the literature at the time was saying. Um, but then we started seeing more and more, um, and the rationale for this were, you know, this is all due to improvements in pre-hospital transport. So now we had folks who are making it, you know, who are dying out in the field, now making it to the hospital. Um, but how are they doing? Um, and so there was uh, this, you know, this study here from King County. It was a partnered study between uh, the trauma center and the coroner's office, or not the coroner's, the, um, uh, the, the local... Um, um, the, the local agencies. So it was a retrospective uh, uh, review. They identified 69 patients. Unfortunately, 47 were diagnosed post-mortem. So even though we were getting people to the hospital alive, they had such bad injuries that they weren't making through their initial hospital stay. Um, 22 would be diag you know, were diagnosed um, in the hospital. Um, so what we saw was we were, more patients were making it to the hospital, um, but there was still an incredibly high mortality rate. Uh, but then we start seeing more and more, and that's because of you know the expertise, um, a lot of it you know a lot of it coming from here in Seattle um, about the importance of early recognition and the importance of an early diagnosis. Uh, so how do we make this diagnosis? So sometimes it's clear, uh, and sometimes it's not. So here's you know this X-ray, pretty clear. Um, what, this injury requires the catastrophic failure of uh, multiple key restraints to craniocervical instability. So you need disruption of all of these things, the facet capsule, the tectorial membrane, the alar ligament, if it's present. Um, uh, There's one of Dr. Chapman and Dr. Bell Barber's uh, uh, you know, biomechanical studies that really highlights this. Um, and distraction is the hallmark of this injury. So here with the CT scan, you see distraction both at, between the occiput and C1. You see uh, distraction between C1 and C2. Um, and as with any patient, you want a thorough history and exam when that's obtainable. Um, but again, patients are often hemodynamically unstable. They may have unusual cord uh, injury patterns because the injury is happening at the area where there's the decussation of um, several of the pathways. Uh, there may be cranial nerve involvement, particularly in abducens palsy because of the tension on um, you know, the nerves that lead to that. Uh, and patients are often limited by exam. And so you're just consulted for a look at the CT scan. Um, and it requires a really critical review of the CT scan because sometimes this is the only sign of this catastrophic injury. Um, so the normal OC joint, very congruous. It's, uh, there's no asymmetry uh, in it. Um, and this is sort of, and any deviation from this in a trauma patient should raise the concern uh, for this injury. So here's a 37-year-old hit uh, by a car. He was intubated in the field. The EMS said that he's moving, he was moving all of his ex extremities. Um, and this is a CT that he presents. So here we see there are multiple sort of, uh, you know, signs. So you have distraction at the OC. Sorry, uh, distraction at the OC joint, distraction between C2, the uh, Bayesian dense interval is increased. There's a huge amount of soft tissue injury, uh, essentially, you know, very, a very displaced fracture. So the diagnosis in this case is, is pretty straightforward, okay? 
Um, but you have to be looking at it because if you just a cursory glance at the spine, you're like, the alignment's all fine, it's gonna be okay. So every CT scan, we, you know, our residents know, uh, and they do a great job of this, is you need to interrogate the upper cervical spine um, for every CT scan, regardless of the severity of the injury because we don't wanna miss these injuries. Um, on the coronal, uh, it's quite informative. So in this patient, he has both distraction at the, uh, we'll come back to that. Um, the MRI, so here's the MRI scan. It shows a fair, you know, so much uh, soft, prevertebral soft tissue edema. You have disruption. Uh, you have some edema posteriorly. Um, and yeah, so here's the coronal, which is quite informative. It tells you where the injury is. In this patient, he has uh, distraction between both the OC joint and C1 bilaterally. Sometimes you have the injury uh, between the uh, occiput and C1 on one side, and it's between C1 and C2 on the other side. Um, so any combination of these is concerning. Uh, and so in this setting, the treatment is pretty clear. You know, we need to stabilize this predominantly ligamentous injury. Uh, if you have injuries between the occiput and C2, you're, you know, that's where you're spanning. Um, and again, this is the variability in injury pattern. You know, sometimes, um, you know, again, it's unilateral. Um, you really need to beware of the poorly fitting uh, collar. So this is a patient, uh, different patient now, uh, only has, you could see the distraction there between the occiput and uh, and C1, um, and you can see the shadow of the collar here. The, he also had a concomitant um, uh, brain injury. Our neurosurgery colleagues wanted to repeat CT head. Um, so in the interim, um, we took off the collar. Uh, we did this sort of, um, you know, put two IV bags or two sandbags uh, and taped the head. And this does two things. First, it gets rid of the distraction, and second, it tells everyone else in the hospital something else is going on, don't unnecessarily transfer this patient. Um, and with the C collar off, you know, you know, we have a, we, don't, we no longer have tension uh, at this level. So just beware of the poorly fitting collar, collar especially in the uh, in you know children. Um, yeah. So sometimes this is all we see, and we forget to look somewhere else in the spine, right? So beware of non-contiguous injuries in these patients who often can't. Uh, there's going to be a high rate of non-contiguous injuries. Uh, this floating cervical spine has been uh, described uh, here in Seattle. This is what scares me, is rarely these injuries may be reduced, you know? So, I mean, it's just like, you know, an, if you have a femur fracture, you might be able to catch an x-ray in which everything is lined up, that doesn't mean it's stable, right? So the OC joint looks uh, reduced, and so how do we, how do we identify this? Um, or really, is, you know, what happens if we, if we miss it? So uh, what are the consequences of missing this? And so there's study after study, so there's this one here, um, where misdiagnosis was the strongest predictor of mortality. It was associated with high ISS scores and actually better motor scores. Um, because if people are doing fine, you're gonna not be as uh, critical of the CT scan. Um, this is uh, one of the earlier studies describing this in the early 2000s, um, again here from, uh, um, from Seattle. And a two-day delay in diagnosis was di associated with a profound neurologic deterioration. Um, and the reason for this is we missed the diagnosis. People are going from imaging study to imaging study. We're dinging their, you know, their upper cervical cord. Um, and so uh, that leads to worse than neurologic outcomes. And the long-term outcomes for this injury is directly related to the neurologic deficit at the time of diagnosis. So if we delay our diagnosis, we're gonna have worse neurologic, uh, worse neurologic exams, which predicts their long-term function. So what are the subtle signs and how do we appreciate the subtle signs? So prevertebral swelling, you know, so at, uh, at C2, um, you know, we use, our cutoff is six millimeters of swelling. In the setting of these injuries, this, it's not seven millimeters. It's a big, you know, it's a, it's a sizable amount of swelling. So it's almost the same width as, you know, the C2 uh, vertebral body. So somewhere on the order of 16 millimeters is what we have here. So it's well above our cutoff. Um, and then appreciating any signs of distraction. Um, and so the C1 arch in these injuries often follows the occiput. So you might see tilting uh, or you know, an increase in distance between C1 and C2. Um, you have widening of the interval posteriorly. You have angulation of the C1, C2 joint. So these so-called V signs, um, both between C1 and C2, and also because of the upward tilt sort of in the anterior cervical ring. You may have um, avulsion fractures. Uh, and these fractures I'm gonna talk about, the majority of the time that you see them, they're in stable injury patterns. So our type three uh, occipital condyles, the majority of type three occipital condyles, we, you know, uh, are stable, but 
it, you need to scrutinize them because a small percentage of them are going to happen in this injury. Um, and the same with the type 1 dents. The majority of type 1 dents in isolation are uh, stable, but if you see it, you just need to scrutinize the soft tissue to make sure you're not missing an AOD. Uh, and then these horizontal sort of cleavage fractures through uh, C1. And so just to recap, so just to put them all sort of on one screen, so any signs of distraction, so a type 3 occipital condyle, uh, a type 1 dense, um, the horizontal C1 ring fracture, and uh, tilting of the C1 ring. So these are signs that there's maybe the upper cervical sign, uh, spine saw some distraction, and then any uh, signs of significant soft tissue disruption, so namely the soft tissue swelling. So, you know, these are things that we sort of look at on uh, and try to, you know, quickly identify. The, again, those signs of distraction, any one of those individually uh, is most likely stable, but you just need to, it needs to heighten your suspicion to look for this. So let's say you see these subtle signs, you don't know what to do with it. Um, you get an MRI and there's some edema and it's not specific. Um, and this is um, where, you know, sort of the traction test, you know, anytime we have uncertainty about the stability of an injury pattern in orthopedics, whether it's an ankle fracture, uh, we, you know, we do an exam under anesthesia and any diastasis is abnormal. Uh, these findings are not uh, subtle. And then these patients are consented for both the MUA and the fixation. So you can do everything in one go. And so what happened in the early 2000s? So with this increased recognition of these signs and the increased recognition of timely diagnosis, um, you know, the, missed, the late diagnosis rate across, you know, trauma centers that were looking for these injuries uh, decreased uh, considerably. And again, as we said, the outcomes, um, you know, um, so in terms of the outcomes, they're again directly correlated to the neurologic status at the time of diagnosis and also related to their concomitant injuries, to their concomitant TBI uh, and trauma. So in 30 years, uh, which is a pretty short time period, we've gone from this being a potentially survivable issues um, to identifying survivors uh, and studies where we say it's no longer a death sentence to, you know, to review articles where we're talking about the long-term outcomes and future directions. Um, and so we've gone, again, from not surviving in the field to making it to the hospital and dying to, you know, with increased recognition, maximizing the potential outcome for these devastating injuries. Um, and again, improved outcomes with timely recognition, appropriate immobilization, minimizing unnecessary transfer, definitive fixation, and appropriate total care. Uh, so the take home points are to maintain a high index of suspicion. Um, these injuries, even when they're recognized, are still uh, associated with a significant high morbidity and mortality. Um, and so every C suspected C-spine injury should be uh, evaluated for the subtle signs of an AOD. Patients are lucky to have sustained these injuries in an era where they're being recognized, and we don't need to rely on luck to identify these injuries when they present themselves to us. So thank you. So one of the scariest things, I thought that was a really excellent review, and I love as somebody who was uh, interested in this field, uh, seeing a next generation uh, take a fresh uh, look at it and adding a new kind of a big picture perspective. So really well done. One of the scariest things for me was pediatric patients with AOD. Yeah. Uh, this was something we published on that also, where we never had a real denominator. We yeah. had no idea how often that happens. Yeah. There's a disturbing amount of missed injuries that was attributed to brain injuries, especially abused children, uh, especially the very young, yeah. the, the shaken child syndrome. Yeah. Um, so how is this uh, being handled now? They're obviously at a high risk. They have a large head. They have well, lack soft tissues, and again, everybody's focused on something else yep. rather than the cranial cervical junction. How is that evolving as a perspective for you, for instance, in San Francisco now? Yeah, uh, well, you know, I am uh, entirely at an adult hospital. All the pediatric trauma goes, um, but you know, the you know, there's you know, I think the injury identification is still key. Um, you know, you need to. There are some particular radiographic findings in the young, so the synchondroses uh, at C2. Sometimes there's an injury through the synchondrosis, but the distractive one, you don't want to miss that. Um, the, in, in, the immediate um, immobilization is different. You need pediatric headboards to make sure you're not, you know, tilting uh, people forward. Um, but to be honest, I have yet to see uh, a pediatric patient, and I, uh, and it's probably because of the, you know, so if I do come one, I'll probably call you uh, in terms of um, sort of the management. But with the, in the young, we could probably, you know, there's a, a much higher threshold for um, surgical fixation. Um, but uh, again, I don't think too many folks have, you know, a long, you know, a, a pretty significant 
the, uh, the difference of kids is, uh, first of all, they're really yeah. neglected there or yeah. not seen. And MRIs are very difficult to get in pediatric yeah. patients. You have to intubate yeah. them, basically. And the other factor is the controversy of treatment that becomes real. Yeah. Uh, so we've ourselves published on some patients that we just kept at bed rest in a yeah. halo and we did not yeah. operate on them. Yeah. And colleagues at a national meeting in San Diego showed several cases that they just treated at bed rest yeah. over like two months. Uh, so I'm just curious that a large trauma center like uh, Memorial Herman, um, uh, you take, uh, you cover your pediatric trauma they also. No, they, Most of it I thought you guys uh, get those also, no. But so, so for me, that was always a big scare because yeah. at Harborview, we got the pediatric trauma. Yeah. Children's would not take them. And the missed injury rate there was tragic, literally, because we would be, be yeah. called to Children's and go over there and then see what basically it was a missed injury. So yeah. just wanted to raise that perspective. Yeah. Um, are we over treating? So that was the title of your talk. So yeah. are there patients so the, where like when they have an Atlanta axial dissociation, a vertical yeah. one, where we don't have to go to the occiput yeah. to stay with Dr. Ramey's yeah. thoughts? Yeah. So I think with the Atlanta axial dissociations, you get an MRI, it shows edema everywhere. My approach to those is just to start off with, a, you know, I can send the patient for a C1, C2 fusion, uh, and then we do a traction test uh, after, you know, so uh, we'll instrument C1, C2. Uh, while they're prone, we usually have them uh, positioned with a Mayfield and we'll pull traction. We'll have one, you know, uh, I'll go up to the top and we'll do a live floral exam. If there's any distraction between C1 and C2, that's going to be our threshold to go up to C2. But for atlantoaxial, you can limit your fixation. You don't want to take on, you know, add unnecessary morbidity. Great. Okay. Um, so I thank you for that. And you're heading over to the lab then? Yep. And maybe we'll just improvise. Uh, uh, David, is there somebody in the lab? Thank you. That's right.